Okay, welcome to the monthly webinar presented by Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta. We want to begin by thanking Georgia Legal Services for hosting this webinar and making it available on its website. The information provided during this webinar does not constitute specific legal advice and is for informational purposes only. And my name is John Mills. I'm with Barnes and Thornburg's Atlanta office. And today we're going to talk about distressed nonprofits. It's going to be part one of, uh, of, of two. And part one today is can the organization be saved? And next month, uh, November, we're going to look at uh, what to do if it can't be saved in issues of, of, of effectively liquidation or reorganization. Uh, I should say before I start that the mission, if you look at slide two, you'll see that the mission of, uh, uh, I'm talking about the mission of Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta is to provide free legal assistance to community based nonprofits that serve low income or disadvantaged individuals. And uh, Pro Bono Partnership manages eligible, eligible organizations with volunteer lawyers from leading corporations and law firms in Atlanta who can assist nonprofits with their business law matters. And having participated in that, I can tell you it's, 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 that that's exactly what happens. Uh, you need to be, if you look at slide three, You'll see it has the eligibility requirements. You must be a 501c3 that located uh, in or around Greater Atlanta and serving low-income or disadvantaged individuals and be unable to afford legal services. And with that, uh, we'll get to the, uh, uh, to the substance. Uh, go to slide four. Uh, and the question that we're here to talk about today for, for, for an hour or so is, can the organization be saved? And the primary thing you have to understand is Understanding the numbers, that's the key to it. This is not, it's not that difficult. The choices that you face once, once you've, what you, if, you, if you're looking at a distress situation, the choices that you face kind of become clear to you once you understand what your numbers are. So what you need to do is identify what records you have, and by that, you know, what records if you own property, you have your mortgage uh, records, your deeds, do you have uh, uh, and, and basic, sort of basic information? And I'll go into these in depth in the, in the other slides, but you want to look, identify records, you want to identify your income and your sources of income, identify what assets you have, Ident identify your operating expenses, identify long-term liabilities, and also identify taxes, what taxes you pay. And I, I go to slide five, and this is where I'll delve into it. When I say identify financial records, uh, those of you who may be lucky enough to have summary data, which we'll get into in a little bit, uh, won't, won't, it will, will, will not have, have, have issues uh, with respect to locating this kind of information because you will have already had it. Uh, but you want to look at ledgers, and that is just cash in, cash out. Do you keep track of how you, what you do, do you pay your bills? You want to gather up bank statements. What, what do you have? Do you have, uh, what kind of accounts do you have? Uh, if you have investment accounts for endowment funds, you know, what do those look like? Just gather all that information together. If you do any kind of paid services, do you have, how do you keep your receipts? Do you have that information available? And you even need to get down to try to identify what you have even in the way of basic stuff like cancel checks or deposit slips. And other documents you might have uh, are uh, you know, just be affected by, by what you do. And I had mentioned one of them, for example, investment account information uh, or some other stuff. But, but gather as much of it as you can. You also have to have, uh, if you have mortgages, loan documents, anything like that, you need to get it. There's one organization that I've assisted before that makes loans to folks who can't, uh, 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 handicapped individuals who can't afford to modify vehicles. And, and uh, they, they make the loan so that they can, they can buy a vehicle that, that is then enhanced and it's much more expensive. And uh, they're holding the, the paper on that, the mortgage on that. And so what you need to do is identify those sorts of assets and information, find, get, pull all that, all that together, all those documents together, because it's going to be important to try to figure out, uh, uh, figure out what you've got in, what, in order to figure out what you're going to do if you've experienced a downturn and if you're, if, you're, if you're having issues with respect to, to, to paying your bills. Now, summary records. If, you, if you're lucky enough to have this, what you want to have is a balance sheet or an income statement or a cash flow statement. And what we're going to go over today is if you don't have that stuff, uh, if you gather all this together, you will effectively be in a position to create it yourself if you don't have the accounting assistance to do it. Uh, and, but, but a balance sheet is effectively just 
It's my it's just just assets and liabilities and income and, and, and liabilities. What income do you have? What expenses do you have? What are your long time liabilities? Do you have mortgages? That kind of thing. When are those going to come to you? And you just get to find out a picture of what your your, your financial uh, uh, health looks like. And if possible, it's good if you can track that back a few years, particularly if you're in distress now, so you can try to track what has happened. Because it's easy to sit in a room and say, well, uh, you know, our donations were down, or we didn't get enough income, what we usually see from something else, from, from some source. But what you'll find is, if you can, if you, if you can develop summary data or you have it, you, you'll find surprising things that may be impacting it. For example, you may realize certain expenses are much higher than you ever thought they'd be. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting exercise if you can put that stuff together. Um, the other thing is to see if you have any audits. If you're, if you're able to do, if you have a, a, a CPA firm and you're doing audits, reviews, or compilations, get those together if you have them. Uh, and just as if, it's just as I said with a balance sheet or income statement or cash flow, see if they're up to date. If they're not, try to get them up to date. And if, and, and if, uh, uh, and, and that will involve uh, going back to, to where I've mentioned in slide five about gathering all that basic information because that's what goes into these summary sheets and what's going to be necessary for you to try to look at and figure out what you're going to do. Also, assets. Have you got appraisals of assets? Uh, if you own real property, are there any recent appraisals of that? So you have some notion of what what uh, uh, your your assets are worth. Uh, if you've got an endowment fund, you're not going to have an appraisal, but you're going to want to know, you know what is the value of that. Uh, if you have loans, uh, for, for example, if you you have you've made loans to others and you've got you, you're holding mortgages or, or even unsecured debt, have some notion of what those are worth and maybe someone can look at those or you can get an idea of what, what those might be worth. And then the Form 990, you've got to get up to date on those if you don't and this will help to do that if you haven't done it, you know, for, for your, you know, even though you're not paying taxes, you've got to report and so uh, that, that is a summary sheet effectively. And it it it'll, it'll you know if you if you've got that up to date you can you, can, you probably will have, have gathered everything that you need to have with respect to, uh, to 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 get the basic data in place to look at the to, to look at summaries and figure out what you're going to do. But the main thing is, and the last question here on slide six or six are these, are these records current? And if they're not, you're going to have to bring them current because you're not going to know what's going on. It's almost like if your household if you're having issues with respect to you know, somebody's got salary that's been cut or lost their job and you're trying to figure out what you're doing you can't you can't do it without up-to-date summaries and, and figuring out how you're gonna you know, where where money's coming from what assets do we have what liabilities do we have because what you're effectively doing is sitting down and figure out how to how to how to cut mix and match what can be done so let's go to slide seven the other, the next thing to do as a part of this process is who knows the numbers you know, do you have a board of directors that's actively engaged in finances or are there a committee of the board? Because you want to involve those folks in this process of gathering the information because sometimes uh, various, various people, knowledge can be compartmentalized about things, uh, about numbers and about uh, uh, certain instances of expenses or questions of why, why do we pay this or why do we do that or what is our you know, what, what, what is our situation with respect to donations? Because in, in, in some organizations, I know certain directors or certain officers may be responsible for, for certain, certain aspects of income, and like they're, they're, they get donations from certain places, and we need to know from them what, you know, what's the story on those, on those sources and things like that. So look at your board of directors, your officers, what employees do you have? That know the numbers, and you want all those folks in the room when you find to, to, to decide to, to when you when you're trying to determine what records you have, what summary data you have. Just have those folks so you can talk through who knows what's where. It's an easier way to do it rather than than one person deciding. Okay, I'm going to go on and sort of exercise and try to find find stuff and find out about stuff. If you have everybody who knows the numbers in the room, you'll identify it. Sometimes folks forget about things. As strange as that is. Um, we had, uh, I, I helped a, 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 a entity in Monroe, Monroe, Louisiana a couple of years ago that started out as a nursing home, long-term care facility, and branched into low-income housing, buying, buying houses and having mortgages on it for Section 8 tenants. And uh, in the process of helping that out, because, we, because when we, we, 
we couldn't get everybody in the room. Um, I sent someone to Monroe for three days who found you know, ten houses that these folks didn't know they had. And, and so it sounds crazy, but it's true. So you, you get, if you get everybody in the room, folks would, would know that because once it was discovered, oh yes, that, yeah, oh yeah, that, yeah, we've had that and that kind of thing. And so do you have any volunteers who help out with numbers? That's another thing. And do they know, do they know what the numbers are? Are they up to speed on this stuff? And if, they, and if you have any of those, you need to know that. And uh, um, uh, please, it, 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 if, you, if, you, if you're in trouble, make sure everybody understands the importance of having a big confab meeting and let's, let's you know, to hash this stuff out and understand what your numbers are. So it's just going to be, and, and a little later on, there's going to be a little incentive for a lot of these people to come called taxes and their personal liability perhaps. So we'll, 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 we'll get to that. The next thing you want to do, go to slide eight, is to identify income sources. What do you have for income? Uh, and, you know, and how does it come in? Do you have grant funds? Are those conditioned in any way? Uh, um, and and we'll, well, I'll talk about that a, a, a little later because sometimes what's you know, the way grant funds are conditioned may, will, may restrict you in what you can do about trying to whether it would be to cut employees or cut back on services or something that you're trying to do. It may be that particular, a particular income stream has things attached to it in terms of expenses that can't be, can't be, can't be altered. Uh, you want to look at donations you know, and, and, and what have you had coming in there? Do you have paid services? Uh, uh, do you have a, a passive income uh, or income from endowment funds? Do you have other passive income, for example? Do you have any merchandising that you do? Do you have, uh, and this is probably more applicable to the larger charities or lar larger organizations, do you have trademarks you know, do you, do you, do you, where you, where you're, uh, uh, got, got, the, got it on T-shirts or something else? It's just to just, just sit and think about what it is that you do. Do you have sales? Do you have... Now there's, there's, I've, I've helped out one where they sold sort of secondhand clothing. It was almost like a sort of little Goodwill type store. They had sales from that. What is the income from that? How does that happen? Uh, so you, you pull it together. And this seems pretty basic, but you'd be surprised at how difficult when you, when you start to look at it, you'll be surprised what you find. Now, go to page uh, uh, slide nine, conditions are in use, and this is what we talked about. This is what I mentioned. Are there any restrictions on the use of it? Because sometimes donations or grants can, can be restricted and you'll be handcuffed as to what you can do with that. It'll let you know at the end of the day whether you need to go back perhaps to the, and I don't know, you, you, you always know this better than I do, whether you can go back to the source of the funds and ask if that can be modified in light of current circumstances, at least temporarily or something to that effect. Um, and and uh, but but you've got and if you've got employees that are tied to that particular income source, and and, and, and are you restricted in use? Because I know that many many term times grants are not for just you know here's some money and you spend it like you want to, and so you've got to you've got to understand what that is so you know what your flexibility, if any, is going to be. Now go to slide ten, and what you're really looking at once you do this, you if you don't have summary data. Um, what you've done is if you've assembled all your records or found out what they are and you've figured out what your assets are, you've figured out what your income is, um, you want to know well, what's changed. And this is you want to do this before you go to expenses. Just find out what, what happened. You know, we're feeling a pinch. What did we lose a grant source? Did we lose an income source? Did donations go down? If so, how? Try to track that back as much as you can, because what you're going to be surprised to find is that particularly if you have donations or something that, that may have started falling off before, for example, like right now, you, it'll be conventional wisdom, well, all our donations dropped off in 2009 or something, or they started in the late 08. Uh, I've helped a few organizations that figured out that this was an issue that started back in 06. They just didn't really see it. And it happened for reasons that didn't, you know, unrelated to the economy and then the economy exacerbated the situation. So this, this is what, this is where, so we started to get into the nuance of sort of the kind of thing that I, I do is you, you go back and look, why did this happen? And sometimes it's not the easy answer. There's some structural answer, there's some answer about uh, that, that, that isn't, isn't there. Maybe there was a key employer volunteer that left and uh, that was responsible for certain donations uh, just in a commercial setting, a key salesperson might have left. Nobody even realized it was a key, key salesperson until after, gee, they left, and then 
maybe sales started tailing down gradually and then the economy tanked and you realize that you can trace but 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 in the in the wisdom as well that you know the sales in this geographic area for example fell off for for uh, because of the economy when in fact you can trace it back to the departure of the key employee and that no one realized uh, and, and same thing there so so you need to look at these this is not as easy as it sounds and so, so if, you can, if you can track it back, I say at least five years. If it's difficult, if you just don't have the records, you don't have the records. But do, you know, do the best you can if you're really trying to assess this, that this is, you know, in, 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 in as effective a way as possible. Now go to slide 11. Next thing, go, what do you own? What is that, is it, do, do exactly do you have? Do you have real estate? Do you have personal property? Do you have vehicles? Do you have equipment? You have, uh, then that's tangible personal property. Do you have intangible personal property? Do you have notes receivable? Do you have bonds? Do you have stocks? What is it that you have? Assemble that. And this gets back to when I was asking uh, in a prior slide where you ask yourself, do you have appraisals for any of this stuff? Because you might have it, but what the heck is it worth? And you can get, with real estate, you can get little indications of what it's worth by. Uh, you know, there's something called that you're probably familiar with it, a drive-by appraisal. You know, you can sometimes, or, or you, even yourself, with the, you know, one of the wonders of the internet is you can go and you can see what the comparable sales for the uh, kind of asset that you have are in the area. And like if you own houses, if you own whatever it is, a warehouse, any kind of real property, you can get comparable sales generally from that. It's fairly easy. If you have vehicles, you can go online and get the blue book and you can figure out what that is. And that's very comprehensive in terms of you know, condition of the vehicle and make and model and that kind of thing. And you can look at it because you want to, what you're going to want to look at, which we'll get to next, is if you've got debt on that, does it make any sense to try to keep it? Do you turn it back to the winner? What do you do? And you, you have to know what it's worth. Now, on notes receivable, a little harder, and you want to try to reach out if you can to a professional that might be willing to help. If you can't pay them, hopefully you can get a, uh, um, uh, some, some, some pro bono assistance for it because that is, that is basically gauging what's the, you know, what's the possibility that that can be, that that can be uh, um, uh, sold. And would, would someone buy this note and step into our shoes in terms of, of receiving that income? And you have to decide whether it's appropriate for it to be sold because there's some kinds, for example, uh, organization, and we, we deal with them on an ongoing basis because at first we were helping them try to organize. This was the, the organization that, that finances vehicles. So for, first trying to just organize what are we doing, the next is, but we have people going bankrupt and they're not paying us back. What do we do? And you know, those sorts of notes are tougher to assign because your mission is intimately tied up with the notes and the kind of borrowers that you have and you want to, you know, you want to just sell that to some, you know, some vulture fund that buys sorts of things in bulk or things like that. Uh, so you have to be, you have to be careful and, and just think about, about whether there's any restrictions that, that, that you have on that. Now go to slide 12. Now, this is identifying your monthly operating expenses. Again, it looks fairly simple. You're looking at real estate, you know, what is your lease payment, your mortgage payments, what's your payroll, what do you pay for utilities, what do you pay for equipment and vehicles, do you have leases, do you have loans on computers, equipment. You know, a lot of people, for example, lease copiers. Uh, do you have some unsecured debt? Do you have credit cards that you pay, that, that, that you use, like to buy office supplies or things like that because it's more efficient than petty cash? Uh, uh, you could have a revolving line of credit. That's less common, but uh, that kind of thing. What insurance do you pay? Do you have to, you know, liability insurance for your directors and officers? You've got property casualty if you own property. Uh, you're going to have insurance for vehicles if you have those, or if you own your own equipment, particularly have loans on it, lenders going to require that. You also, what are you paying for maintenance? The folks who are coming and cleaning the building or the office space out, things like that. And just think of other things that you do. And just, just, just you've got to, you've got to, to, to really sort of track that stuff down and how you spend money. Uh, years ago, uh, uh, in the early 90s, my wife and I went through an exercise where we got a Quicken, Quick, QuickBooks or a Quicken program, and we tracked every little dime we spent. And we were shocked at sort of where, what our monthly expenses were and sort of where they were. We'd never really tracked them. We kind of, we thought we knew what they were, and it turned out that they, they weren't quite what we had anticipated. We knew we were coming up short every month, or it felt like we were, we were moving paycheck to paycheck, and we couldn't figure out why. And it turned out, you know, obviously it's we ate out a lot, but, I mean, I have children and all that, but the point is that you, you would be surprised, even though that's a personal story, you'd be surprised where your money's going if you try to track it. Now go to slide 13. 
you want to look at when you when you, when, you, when you look at it, 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 your expenses as part of that, and this will be part of a, a this is this is similar to gathering the source documents that I talked about, like if you're trying to find out cancel checks and things like that. Look at your if you've got a vehicle. Look at the finance documents or look at the lease uh, lease documents. If you've got a copy or lease, look at that. Because what you want to know is what are the remedies for breach. What's going to happen if you call up uh, 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 the, the copier company and say, come get them, we don't need them, or come get two of the three we have, that kind of thing. What's going to happen if you try to turn a leased vehicle back to a, to a leasing company, finance company, or a financed vehicle, or what, what are the restrictions on transfer if you do that? Uh, that kind of thing. And also employment contracts. If you have anybody that's under an employment contract, what happens then? Uh, if you terminate, if, if, if you terminate or try to cut the uh, uh, salary of that particular employee or officer, uh, excuse me, what's going to happen? And uh, and the issue, and also just it comes probably rare in this setting, but you also if, if, if it comes up non-compete issues, although I, I can't imagine what it would be, but it you know could rear its ugly head. So you got to understand what what the ramifications are of making certain decisions. It's not just as simple as you have to trust me about this of just calling them up and saying, well, we can't pay, come get the two copiers. Because what tends to happen is while you're having trouble, the copier company's having trouble too. Because you're the, you're the, you're the you know, 800th customer that's called that month nationwide to turn back two copiers. And so their folks are, 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 are on, the reaction to that is they're told to take a very, very hard line with people on the, on the breach side. When times are good, you can turn back the copier or the vehicle. When times are bad, everybody's hurting, so this, you, you'll find there's less flexibility. So you have to, under, it's more like a turn it back and you know, do what you're going to do, it's that, that sort of thing. We can, that, that's on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not asking anybody to, to be that way, but, but what you need to understand is what the risks are if you turn it back in terms of suit and things like that. The reality is, and I'll get into this when we talk about options, is that suing you over two copiers in a lease is really not worth it. So you are, you're going to have this posturing on the other side. That's not, much, not so much law or anything. That's just a kind of what happens in life. And I know, and, and, and so we'll, 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 I'll mention that. Okay, slide 14. Find out what your mortgages are, your loans, your vehicles. We're sort of repeating ourselves here, but you got to. You got to know what these things are, and know 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 what these are, and what what the what your ability is to do it, to deal with them. Now, taxes. This is the biggie. This is where everyone falls down. Do you have real estate taxes, or is anything owed? The issue with real estate taxes is that it attaches to the property, and if it's going to be transferred, those taxes have to get paid up. Uh, I'm not talking about whether there be a sheriff sale and all this. And, to, to foreclose, and that's why the state, the state or the county doesn't need to pursue tax liens generally because they have to be cleared up at closing. So if you do any kind of an asset transfer on, on real property, those need to be up to date or understand that whatever you think the sales price of the real property is, you've got to deduct that from it. Sales and use taxes. If you've done any sort of, if you're doing, doing anything that's subject to sales and use tax, are you current on that? That's, that's important because if, if you flip ahead to, fly, to, to, to slide 16, you'll see there may be personal liability for officers and directors for payroll, sales and use taxes, and unrelated business income taxes. So you've got to start looking at that. Not so for real estate, but now we're into this, into, into these issues. So sales and use taxes, are they paid or are they up to date? Payroll taxes, that's the FICA, that's the Social Security, that's all the withholding that you're supposed to do for employees. Have you done that? Uh, if you have not, get that up to date, if, if at all possible, because that is a, is a situation where there is personal liability for the folks who are responsible for the numbers. Unrelated business income taxes. That is, do you do something that's not related to what you do? For example, I mentioned, do you have a trademark? Do you sell t-shirts, merchandising, or something that's not related to the fact that you provide low-income housing to somebody, or you perform other sort, you know, some other sort of service? Uh, those have to be up to date too, because they, they they will people will come after you. And go to slide 16, and this is the this is the alert. Now, the reason why it's important is sometimes in the past there's been some loosey-goosey attitudes about it from the state or the federal government about collecting on these things. 
But just as the copier lease company needs money because it, all its customers are turning back, I don't care what what your political affiliation is. There's no there's no what you feel about it. There's no question. We've got everybody. Cities are, are like, for example, Atlanta city government's in a deficit. Fulton County's in a deficit. State George is in a deficit. The feds are in a deficit, and um, they are hard on this stuff in terms of trying to collect the money. That's, that's another feature of what goes on because they're starved for cash. And so uh, you got to be you got to be careful about this about this tax issue because it's real important. There's there's much less flexibility at the moment than there used to be. Uh, not that there was ever much, but there was some. There was there were there were ways to cut deals that are now sort of not not available. Now let's go to the uh, slide 17 and talk about the options. And one one thing to do if you own real property is refinance it because right now interest rates are fairly low, and it could be that you could you could do that assuming that you've got a value that makes sense with, with sense with the debt that it's on it. If you can't. May have to look at turning it back. The reality is, um, in, in in terms of a mortgage, and I apologize for looking at the scene. That's what I do when I think the uh, uh, the it, it's banks don't have a lot of appetite for taking property back right now. They're they're all full up. We have five years, about five years of housing inventory and five years of retail and commercial space inventory here in Atlanta. So. There's somewhat of an appetite for refinancing if you can sort of have a strategy of this is, this is what we can pay. The problem is regulations can sometimes prevent, because you, you, you read the paper about, about incentives to write down mortgages for individuals, but it's not in the same place for organizations or for whether it be 501c3s or, or like C corps, S corps, you know, regular corporations. So you got to be. But, but go to the lender and talk about it if you want to keep the property. There, there's, sometimes there's a way to do it. If, you, if you've got a value that a lot, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you've got a, a good debt, uh, debt to value ratio, go refinance. That's one way because you'll at least save, save a little bit on your monthly mortgage payments because I'll bet your interest rate can go down. Or sell it. Just sell it. And you need to check your mortgage because sometimes they're not recourse. And so, you, you know, the organization won't be sued by the lender to recapture the difference between the, the, uh, the, the sales price and the debt that's added on it, mainly because of the nature of the organization. It's just presumptively you're not going to have any money, so if you just sell, sell it, give the sale proceeds to the bank, let us go, we're, we're done, we can't, we can't get in it. So that's one way. Same thing with a car. Um, if you have vehicles and equipment, that's it. Main thing to do if you've got loans on stuff is to uh, when you're when you're when you're looking at sale or refinances, go to the lender and, fe and confess. You know this situation. The main thing lenders have is they're always talking about borrowers, whatever sh shape or size they come to. And like Reese, like there was a large church in California that filed yesterday, the Crystal Cathedral Ministries. No matter what it is, they feel like that they they've been. It, that you haven't been straight with them when you come. And, you know, like, like when I represent lenders, all, bar, all, all borrowers are crooks by the time the lender gets to, the, the, it flops in my lap because projections or promises or assurance or things that have been made, don't do it. Just go, confess. You'd be surprised in some way. You'd be surprised what the flexibility may be for a lender. I'm not talking about the copy or less or, but I'm talking about the lender. Um, Another thing you can look at that, that, that folks don't really look at as a strategy is, well, I've got three old copiers. What if we got one new one? You know, even though there's a copier lease, we return the three. And, and, and this, is, this is something I, I, I mentioned. You need to think about this with all kinds of equipment, whether it be computer equipment, things. And it seems kind of obvious, computer equipment, copiers, phones, whatever it may be, that, that you, you just push the, push the old stuff out. And it could be that you replace because you say, look, we only need two phones. We don't need 15 phones, or we need five phones. Rather than just reduce the number, sometimes you find out you can get the, the one whiz bang phone that does a lot of things, and the, or you get a one copier who can replace three, you know, because of efficiencies and things like that. And you you mainly see this in manufacturing, but it can apply to the office, and that's how people think of it. But go ahead, be open minded about it. There is a way. You'd be shocked at the efficiencies that. If you hit that, that can be created by as they, as they keep making advances on this stuff. Because I mean, I uh, uh, just just 
you know, any walk through an office supply place, you know, you go through there, if you go through about once a year, you'd be, you'd be amazed at what they do with printers. You know, that's another thing. Let's say you have printers and you have a certain kind of printer and, it, and you've got several of them. You'd be surprised what one laser printer can do with the right kind of industrial strength, you know, ability to print. Think about that kind of thing. Also, think about uh, uh, something that you guys are going to have that's not uh, 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 available to sort of normal normal organizations. That is, if you can't if you can't sell, you can't refinance. Give the lender a deed in lieu of foreclosure, and just be done with it. Because uh, you folks don't pay income tax, so you're not going to have debt forgiveness income like normal companies do, and they try to turn it back. So th think about that. But you know, once you've want, but but it's be be, be open about this, and it, and that's what's what's seems weird. Oh, well, we're going to go buy a new copier even though we're, we're having trouble. But, but look at it, right? And once you understand your numbers, you can see where that comes in. When you look at monthly expenses and you can look at a new copier and you can compare, well, what's the lease on that? What's the warranty on that? Are they going to maintain the thing? And it's kind of like a car. If you've ever had an old car, like I have one now that's a 2003 that I'm almost, I've, I've gone, I'm proud to drive my Honda. But every time I go to the shop now, it costs a thousand dollars a quarter. It seems like. So at some point, it makes more sense for me to just have another, you know, just a standard you know, financing arrangement on a new one, and with the warranties and all that. So look at all that kind of stuff. So it's just, it's just, so, so think about it. Now, 18. Look at slide 18. This is where you really should be able to do yourself uh, some good if you rent, and that is negotiating with landlords. As I said, there's about five years of uh, commercial inventory. Uh, space here, uh, lease inventory, retail inventory. There's 30. There's 30 percent or more vacancy rates in commercial space. Uh, landlords are not. They are flexible when you come and say we we can't pay. We're going to have to get out of here if we can't do something. They are very flexible. They're flexible about space reduction. Uh, they're flexible about generally about uh, uh, rent reduction, uh, and they and and also you taking on a subtenant. One thing is if, let's say, you have a whole floor of a building, it could be that you know of another organization that's a 501c3 that's also having trouble. You folks could share space, partner up, and we're going to talk about another benefit of that too. And, and sometimes uh, uh, you could have two, three, four organizations in the same, in the same house in the same building. Just because you've always had your own space doesn't mean that this is going to be a horrible thing. Uh, you, one thing you might want to look at is you know, what do they do versus what do you do? So is there, you know, is there any sort of way, you know, what are the employees look like? Because one of the things, and I'll just go ahead and talk about it now, that we could talk about that, that, that you want to look at too, is do you want to share employees? For example, the obvious one is receptionist, you know, the reception. If you, have a, if you have somebody at the front desk that does it and is doing sort of normal paperwork, you'll want to probably, um, you, can, you can share that person because that's a sort of a, that's a fungible you know, sort of task, or, or, or something can be done, uh, and there may be other 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 tasks like that that can be done that 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 are are can be done by uh, one person for multiple organizations. But again, that could depend on what what they do. So one of the things you want to look at when you space share is how compatible are you with with the, with the organization? Because if you if you're it's so that so you you could have those opportunities. Um, you need to look at your lease, though, because your landlord may you may have a prohibition on the uh, may have prohibition on subletting. Uh, may have to go to the landlord. And again, landlords will be flexible, but understand that you have to go to them because it's one thing. Uh, landlords are like lenders; they want you to be straight with them. And if you come, if you go, because landlords got to remember, a landlord has a mortgage on the building, and a landlord's got certain restrictions. So it's a flow down, so to speak. Think of it: Bank of America is sitting there with the mortgage on the high-rise building, and if you've got a floor. A lot, of, a lot of what's in your lease uh, that you think is ticky-tack or they won't care is actually that's Bank of America that cares about that because they care about how that building's being maintained because it's their collateral until it's paid off. So it's a, you get a flow through down on the provisions and so um, a, lot of, a lot of what you see is, 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 is something that you go to the landlord and the landlord has to report back up to the, like the tenant mix. The landlord very often, the tenant mix is reported to the bank. And the bank wants to understand if you're meaning this kind of, because the bank is concerned. What happens is, let's say you have a shopping center. I'll give a shopping center example. 
uh, you have a shopping center and it's anchored by Target and various other things. And so the uh, Swoozies, for example, went bankrupt uh, uh, last year and it's gone, right? And so, or, or largely gone, and so they closed up the stores. Well, uh, that shopping center has a certain tenant mix and so they don't, they don't want an insurrection porno store going into that shopping center. And not only does the does the, the owner of the shopping center not want that because it affects, but the lender on the shopping center also doesn't want that because that affects, that may run off other tenants as their leases expire or they claim the lease has been breached because the tenant mix requirements have been, have been met. So understand, you just can't take in, so they want to know who it is. And you'd be surprised at the flexibility as long as you have open communication with your landlord. It's when you don't say anything and they're just surprised by the fact that you're doing, then, then <laughs> that there's new faces in the building that, is a, that you have a problem. Now, expenses. Go to page 19, or, or slide 19. Uh, as you probably figured out, look at everything. Nothing, nothing is, you know, ask yourself, well, why do we have the coffee machines we have? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? Question every single thing. Because one of the things that I find, what I, one, of, one of the things that I do uh, uh, in my business in bankruptcy is you'll go into a corporation and typically I'll go in with a with an account, you know, that will look look or, or turnaround consultant. And we'll we'll start looking at the numbers and trying to help out and we'll we'll ask questions about everything. And it's very it's interesting how people don't know well, I don't know why we do the filing that way, or I don't know why we spend money on this, or I don't know why we store our records with Iron Mountain versus some other company, and why we store as many as we do, or how many years we go back, and things like that. So question everything. For example, you know, you have IRS requirements about record retention on certain things. You may have other requirements from, from regulators about that, but, once, but, but if you're holding records for longer, why? Why are you doing that? Why are you paying for storage? And when you're in a distress situation, it's nickels and dimes. It's, it's just, it's just, it looks like, well, that's only 20 bucks a month, or that's only 10 bucks a month. And it's elementary, but there's 10, then there's 30, then there's 10 bucks a month, then there's 30, and the next thing you know, you got, you, you, you get, you start looking at real money, and particularly if you're, if you're operating at a pretty low budget, or your budget's only a couple hundred thousand dollars a year or something, everything that you do can be, can be uh, effective. Uh, and also on the slide, we talked about this space sharing and, and particularly shared employees, shared office ex uh, uh, equipment. You know, if you've got a copy or a lease, they, they sign on to it. Um, I have done this myself. I'm, I had a law firm in Los Angeles that were, we shared a floor. We were 10 lawyers. We shared a floor with a 30 lawyer firm and another five lawyer firm. We all split the all the costs of the copiers, the computers, the, you know, the library, that kind of thing, all the things that we need, the postal machine, all of it. And so think about that because that was an effective way for us to do it. Uh, another thing is it's less effective depending on outsourcing. And it's a, sort of a wild thing, but I know a uh, big thing for law firms right now is we outsource our copying and our this, you know, various sort of office functions, and that, that works more or less. Of, eh, that some days it's effective, some days it's not. But the point is look at things like that. Look at everything, be open minded. Okay, go to page 20, and this is the one I have last. And I always look at this last because I don't, I don't, it's the, it's the one that's most distasteful to me, and that is looking at, 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 at reducing salaries for employees or putting people from full-time to part-time. And when you, when you look at that, of course, it's something I talked about way back when I started, which is you have to look at do you have employees tied to certain types of donations or certain grants? And you know, do you even have the flexibility to do that, or is that inviolate? And then you've got to just sort of look at, look at what else you can do. You're going to have to look at reduced benefits, and you're going to have to look at perhaps switching somebody to independent contracting instead of having full time because you're not paying payroll tax, you're not paying benefits, you're not paying, uh, and, the, and there's a whole slew of ad, ad administrative uh, costs associated with each employee that you don't have. Uh, and then you also need to, to look at what, can they be independent contractors because there's a lot of rules. You, know, you can say somebody's an independent contractor, but the, if you're furnishing the desk, if you're furnishing the tools, if you're furnishing the place, the phone, the whole, in other words, if it walks like a duck and looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, meaning if it looks like a full-time employee and walks like a full-time employee, you know, then it is, and you should have been withholding. And that, tra that gets us back, and that, that can be potentially devastating because of the personal liability for payroll taxes and the like that you have for officers and directors. So, 
you got to be very careful about how you do that. You just can't cavalierly cavalierly say, okay, now you're a you're, you're an independent contractor. So uh, be careful about that. Also think about expanding use of volunteers. Um, I was chairman of the board of, of, a, of a church in California, and we had a situation where the uh, and how I became chairman was that the the prior the board had invested in a bond fund at the suggestion of Merrill Lynch. All of the church's endowment funds were put into a bond fund that then lost money sharply in the late 90s. And we sort of, a long story, had to, I came in to help ladder that out. And then they said, oh, if you know about money, then you can be chairman of the board of the church. But in the process of doing that, uh, we expanded the use of volunteers because it impaired our ability to pay for services that were needed around the church. And uh, we, we fortunately had two longtime employees who were nearing retirement at the time this occurred, so they went ahead and retired and there was no effect on them, but we were able to fill we, as much as possible. So think about that. It's hard, it's tough to do, uh, uh, but uh, particularly because you're, you're just relying on people and their goodwill to do it, but if you can get volunteers to do it, that's, that's something you'd be surprised at what the reception that you'll get. I mean, uh, in that church setting, I was surprised at the, at the folks who would just you know, do something like come and cut grass on Saturdays or something like just, just whatever it is. You'd be, you'd be surprised at the goodwill out there. So don't be, don't be too, uh, don't be, don't be too shy about doing that. Finally, look at, but, but again, the employee thing is very sensitive to me because I don't, I don't like to do that. And that sense of you don't want to wreck lives while you're doing this sort of thing. So, so. Uh, I, I usually advise looking at that last. Now, other thing which sounds strange, look at ways to increase income. I mean, is there something, when you look at your decrease in donations, we'll take that as an example, and if you were to trace it back to something other than the economy, there's another factor. Maybe there's something that you learn in that process to where you can increase them, because it wasn't just something where, where folks are a little short of cash now, so the folks who used to give $100 every year give $50 or $25. So need to, need to, need to look at that, and that's another way. There could be grant money out there that, that you haven't thought about, or maybe you thought about going for it, and you just never did because you didn't need it, and it just didn't seem like it. There are various other things you can do. Should you merge with another, another entity? And that's a, and we sort of, it, or a strategic alliance, and we'll call that's a little bit different from what I talked about, about space sharing with respect to real estate but or, or your office space, but it may end up being the same thing where you sort of hook up with a, with another organization in order to, for you all to get through this. And uh, um, But you, when, you, when you're looking at a merger or looking to a strategic alliance, then you have to sort of get more like, you know, what, what companies, what, what a profit company looks at with a merger. Do, what do you do? What do you do? What are, you know, are there advantages? Do you, do you, do you, are there synergies? You want to look at what happens to employees. Are there, are there redundancies so that if you did merge, you know, some of your employees or some of their employees, uh, the, other, the other entity's employees would have to be let go because they're effectively perform the same functions. That's unfortunately, that's one thing you have to think about in a merger is that's almost inevitable. I've never seen anything where, uh, where that, that doesn't occur. If nothing else, it's, it's just you know, the person, some, somebody who answers the phones or the person who sweeps the floors at night gets let go. But somebody, somebody will get hit. And so that's when, you, when you're looking at that, that's an inevitable consequence of it. So that's it. And, and uh, uh, if you want more information, I'm, I'm going to take questions. But, I don't, uh, but, but if, you, if you want any more information, you can probably contact. You'll see that on slide 22, Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta. And there's the contact information. And next month, we're going to talk about if you can't save all this, what your options are for lining up under state law or doing a bankruptcy case. So no. Nobody's got any questions, so um, I budget. I, I figured for about forty-five minutes for this, and if there are no questions, I mean, I think we're done.